Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here. Since we're in the town meeting break and most school budgets were voted out this week, I wanted to talk a little bit more about education. As you know, yesterday we saw about a third of school budgets get voted down. And while some delayed votes, we're already seeing far more uh, voted down than we typically see. I know going back to the drawing board won't be easy for school boards and administrators, and identifying tools for help has proven uh, to be not that easy for legislature uh, members, uh, legislative men members either. But given how rare these no votes are, uh, this should be a wake up call for everyone. We won't know the exact impact on tax rates and bills until later this spring, but our most recent projections show on average Vermonters will see a 19% increase in their property taxes. Again, it will take some time to see the exact impact of the final school budgets, but at the start this year, we projected education spending to increase by about $230 million over last year. And keep in mind, we already spend $2.1 billion on pre-K through 12 education today. With fewer than 83,000 kids, that's about $25,000 per student, among the very highest in the country. And that's before this year's increase. Now, some may think that spending more than nearly every other state on education is a good thing. And in many cases, it would be. But there are a few reasons why the spending is concerning. First, despite spending a lot more per student than most other states, when it comes to student performance in several areas, we're in the middle of the pack, according to the U.S. Department of Education. And state and national tests show less than half of our third and fourth graders are reading at grade level. And the results are similar when it comes to math. As I've said before, this is not a critique of students, teachers, or parents. But it does tell us that not enough of the $2.1 billion and the increases we see every year is making it to our kids. Second, we simply don't have enough kids in Vermont. Yet school budgets and property taxes continue to grow this year by a record amount. And third, we don't have enough taxpayers to support this level of spending. One of the only states spending more per student than Vermont is New York with a population that's 30 times larger and a more vibrant economy. Most Vermonters can't afford a double-digit increase in their property taxes or any increases in, in anything, for that matter. Take my hometown of Berlin, for example, where the proposed increase would mean almost $1,000 more for a $200,000 home. The average family is going to have to make some difficult decisions over the next year if that holds true, as they contemplate what they can do without. Not to mention those higher income, woes with higher incomes and more flexibility who also know there are more affordable options out there, other states they could move to. I'm concerned this could put our education system further at risk. So I know it's uncomfortable to talk about money and spending, especially when it comes to our kids' education. But the fact is, we have to be realistic about what people can afford if we want any chance of continuing to offer quality education in Vermont. We also have to be honest about what we're getting for what we're spending. As I've said before, if we were just given a check for $2.1 billion to educate 83,000 students, I dare say that we designed something totally different than we're seeing today. This is why I propose major cost containment proposals that would reinvest savings in things like childcare and early learning, STEM, career training, and higher education, helping us improve outcomes for kids and keep keep property taxes in check. With the kind of cradle to career approach I've been advocating for since 2017, we could give kids a better start and open up more career opportunities. 
At the same time, a stronger education system at a price the average person can afford would attract more working families, which means more taxpayers, not more taxes. But you can't attract more working families or keep the ones you have if you can't afford to live here, which is again why my team is focused on finding ways to achieve this vision without a payroll tax for childcare, without new or higher taxes for the general fund, and without exploding property tax bills. Here's a few things I proposed in the past that I believe would have helped. Moved school budget votes so we have a better view of statewide spending. Save money on school employee health care without reducing benefits. Increase the staff to student ratio through natural attrition, still keeping us among the lowest in the nation. Adjusted the income sensitivity formula to target those who need it. Added guardrails for towns that can afford to overspend at the expense of those who can't. I vetoed three budgets to get some buy-in on some of these proposals, but nearly all of them were ignored, and the few that were taken up were changed significantly enough to make them ineffective. More recently, when Act 127 passed, I asked the legislature to address the cost pressures it created before it went into effect, which they didn't do although they did uh, finally address the cap issue a few weeks ago. But it's likely too late to make a difference. Even calls for greater transparency on spending increases and more voting by, by mail has fallen on deaf ears. On top of cost containment, my team has made growing our workforce and creating more housing top priorities. Both are essential to shoring up our education system. But as yet, I haven't seen the House or Senate pass a single housing bill out of their respective chambers. Unfortunately, because the legislature didn't act on the things that I proposed to them in the past, it's going to be very difficult to bring this year's increase down to anything close to reasonable. So it's a bit frustrating when I hear the legislature demanding I come up with some new ideas, despite all the ideas I put on the table in the past which they rejected, and especially when many legislators said I was just fear-mongering about this increase back in December, and they would, get, they would get it down to 2%. So I'd love to hear their ideas on how to do that, and I totally understand. The ideas I put forward in the past would be difficult and take a lot of work to implement. But if we had acted on any one of them, we'd be in a better place today where the decisions and changes needed will be much harder, more urgent, and much, much more painful. So it's important we learn from our mistakes because we've got to get serious about structural changes that make sure more of the money we spend is getting to the 83,000 kids we serve and the people who live, work, and invest in Vermont can afford it. If we don't, if we just pull the money out of another pocket to close the gap, or just raise another tax, we'll be right back in the position next year, and the next year after that, and the year after that. Our kids and our taxpayers deserve better. So with that, I'm sure you might have a couple of questions. Governor, a lot of the uh, ideas you've proposed uh, have come from recommendations in 2017 and 2018. Um, I'm wondering what, you know, hasn't the system changed a lot since then? COVID, you know, new, new burdens on schools. Um, why might it not be time for new ideas? Because we have just basic structural ideas that we think are still relevant today. And as I said, um, we believe if we put some of those in place over time, that we'd be in a better position today. They're still relevant. They don't have to be new ideas. And I'm more than willing to listen to what their ideas are as well. Uh, because, um, and I've, I've said that. You know, we have our, our ideas that we believe can be dusted off and, and at least discussed. 
um, but they must have ideas as well. And there's probably studies out there somewhere that have been done over the last uh, decade or two that could be relevant, I would think. Because this isn't a new problem. This has been evolving over, over ever since Act 60 passed. It's been evolving. And I know they've tried to put some fixes in there. I think Governor Douglas tried to fix it uh, with Act 68, maybe. But it hasn't fixed the structural problems we face. So I think we're going to have to be bold. Uh, we're going to make some tough decisions. It won't help anything today in this budget but it'll help in future budgets, and we have to look forward. Is it time to look at our, just reforming the education funding formula from the bottom up? I mean, it's property taxes now, but like funding it fundamentally in some other way. I, th I think so. I think it's time. There's an evolution of uh, all of these funding formulas, and this might have reached it, its, its life expectancy. Uh, so. Um, so I think we should contemplate that. But at this point in time, I've heard uh, many say, well, we should just go to some sort of an income tax as well, add to that to, to get ourselves out of this. And that's just taking money out of another pocket. That's just going to burden Vermonters further. That's not going to help the situation. So I think, uh, I think it is time, um, but it's just adding another tax isn't the answer. Did um, Act 46, uh, district sort of consolidation law back in 2015, 16, do you think that went far enough? And if, if not, I mean, is there more that the state can be doing proactively with, with school consolidation? I, I do think uh, consolidation is part of the answer. Um, when we have the, uh, the reduction of the number of, of students we, we serve at this point in time, and that keeps dropping, there comes a time when you have an, uh, an infrastructure that, uh, that is too expensive and too large to serve the number of kids you have. So that means, that means closing schools, small schools, and, and combining efforts with schools. I've always looked at here in this region. I mean, you have Montpelier High School right here. You have U32 about four or five miles from here. You have Spalding uh, about eight miles from here. I mean, it seems like there's something more we could do uh, to consolidate, find efficiencies within the system, and 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 um, be able to to have a, a quality education as a result. And I guess when when these decisions right now are made at the local level, I think it was is it Cabot is the one that uh, yeah. in town meeting the voters voted to keep it open again. Uh, you know these are our um, community hubs. You know they're the, the heartbeat, if you will, of your community. So how do you how do you bridge that gap of like? these local decisions that are made, but like big statewide challenges. Yeah, these are, these are difficult decisions. I, I think it was Shap Smith who said when he was speaker, he said, everyone wants us to save money, everyone wants us to close some of these schools, but no one wants it to be their own. And uh, I think that says it all, that we, um, we have to make those, we're here now, I mean, a 20% you know, increase in property taxes uh, would lead us most people to believe we got we have to make some choices we have to make some decisions and i think we're going to have to help on the state level as well to to force those decisions i know at one point uh, when i was in the senate we had uh, after the moratorium was put into place in school construction we left in place an incentive to combine schools um, to consolidate in fact we increased the level of participation from from the state for that, there was not a single taker, uh, as I remember. What are the concrete next steps for you as it relates to solving the problem you've identified? As it relates to education spending, yeah, we'll have to we'll have to first of all see um, what the results are of the uh, failed school budgets. But that's not going to fill the gap. We know that it's, as I said, well over two hundred million dollars. That's what I was surprised when. Legislators said we were going to be able to buy it down, which I knew we couldn't. Um, so at this point in time, we have to do, we have to work together, try and figure out what we can push forward. Um, and we can't use this uh, for political wedges. I mean, that's, that's been used against me for seven or eight years. Every time I brought something up early on about 
doing something with a statewide teacher contract, and I had the NEA out picketing me on on State Street um, when he brought up something about uh, uh, anything, health care, um, consolidation, anything. Um, it was met with resistance and just to make a statement about the next election. So I think, uh, I think you know, this is real. It affects people. We have to also make sure that we're not doing anything else that would burden Vermont as any further in other initiatives. I mean, I'm hearing, again, many legislators are talking about, I think they're in denial about the position we're in because they're still talking about spending more money. We don't have any more money without raising taxes. And I, we're at a tipping point here. And uh, we're going to do some real harm if we don't pay attention, try and figure this out, and try to keep it from getting any worse in the future. But it, we're not going to solve this $200 million problem this year, I don't believe. There's going to be a property tax increase. In the short term for FY25, do you think buying down rates is, a, is part of the solution to this immediate issue? But, but I don't know how we do it. We don't have any funding to do that. So I don't know how you buy it down. So at this point? I think, I, I think we have to prepare ourselves that we're going to be able to work it down. And I know, again, school boards um, are going to have to do a lot of work. And it's not going to have a, a huge effect. I mean, it's not going to take care of the $200 million, um, but it'll have some effect on uh, local tax rates. You had said um, during your last briefing that you were going to um, do some research before deciding which way you were going to vote on your school budget. How did, how did you know? I, I voted no. And what do you, if um, school board members look to you and said, what do, we, what do we have to do, Governor, to get you to vote yes on this thing? What would you tell them? Well, I think we have to just do the best they can uh, to try and find efficiencies within the system. Uh, look longer term. What is it they have for ideas? They, they're on the local level. What is it they think we can do that's palatable? And just get it down as far as they can. But I think this did send a huge mes message uh, to, to legislators um, that we got a problem. National Grid announced the cancellation of the Twin States Energy Link project. I'm just wondering if you have any reaction to that. Yeah, I thought that was unfortunate. I didn't see that one coming um, at this point in time, uh, hopefully. I haven't had a chance uh, to talk to our commissioner about this yet. Um, but the TDI line comes to mind uh, in the uh, and the other uh, half of the state that is still viable, I believe. And hopefully we can move forward with that if National Grid isn't, uh, isn't an option. Because I believe you know, New England still needs the power. I, we had, when I was at the National Governors Association, the New England governors got together. And I uh, heard our you know, friends to the south uh, were bemoaning the fact that they didn't have any renewable energy uh, available to them. So there's a need. We just have to figure out how to get it to them. And I believe TDI could be part of the solution. I've advocated for that for six years. And with today, some other flooding, or kind of flood warning for some towns in Washington County, another early month season week almost, coming off the heels of the disaster declaration that you're looking for. Any thoughts on climate change and how that's impacting Vermonters who are these flooding things? Yeah. It, it's, a couple of things. Uh, one, climate change is impacting uh, the length of our winter or uh, the lackluster winter we had. So we have to, again, do everything we can to acknowledge that and, and move away from carbon emitting uh, vehicles as well as uh, getting to more renewable uh, uh, carbonless electricity sources. So that, but the, from the muddy roads standpoint, um, I think we're, we're seeing this year, because we didn't have, like, typically, as I remember, you know, over the last 20 years, we'd have a, a freeze for the winter. Um, we didn't have all of these thaw, uh, freeze-thaw uh, scenarios uh, that we're, we're experiencing today. So we've been living like mud season, it seems like, all winter. And I think that's having an impact, because 
we always hear in the spring of the year uh, that this is the worst mud season ever, and we'll hear it again now. Um, but I would say that it's because you know the duration of the mud season has been ongoing. Tom um, has some of the uh, lowest staff to student ratios in the country, as you mentioned. Um, I believe that data comes from a study pre-COVID. Um, there's also some recent research from the U.S. Department of Education that shows Vermont has lost the second highest proportion of school staff since COVID. Why have we not started to see some of the cost savings from that uh, loss of educators? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if, um, if they're still building in those costs uh, because they still want to fill the positions. Um, every, every sector uh, in Vermont has been experiencing uh, workforce shortage, and education has been one of them. State has been one of them. Construction, you name it, we've all faced it. Um, so um, this is an area, again, where we need to attract more people into the state. We need those workers, and we need them here so that more are paying taxes as a result. Do you have a, is there a way that you would recommend we get to those staff to student ratios that you've recommended in the past? How, how could legislation make that happen? We, we put forward um, back quite some time ago a way to do it uh, through attrition. Uh, you know, somebody retires out and then you don't, you don't lay anybody off. You just naturally do more with less, so to speak, uh, to grow those. Uh, uh, to make sure that the, the staff to student ratio grows in the right way. Um, so just a marginal type of approach uh, that wouldn't, would be seamless was our, our answer, but we'd be uh, consolidating schools is, of course, the other. But in law, that sounds like um, yeah, put it a in law. recommendation for yep. school boards, but, but how would it look as policy? We just put in law that we would put something in. We had something we've, we've put forward. I mean, we'd be happy to share that with you. I'm sure you've probably, maybe you already have it. Perhaps, yes. Governor, if we have <clears throat> school budgets, there's like 30 of them now that they have to go back to the drawing board, as you say, and they just keep failing and failing. And we can't pass budgets before the yield. I understand they have to take last year's budget, which in this inflationary um, times could mean pretty big cuts, uh, layoffs, cuts to programming, academics. What, what effect, if we get to that point, I mean, how, how much of a concern is, is that for, for you that budgets will keep failing if we have to go to last year's budget? Well, again, I don't know as we've ever seen this level of, um, of failed school budgets. So we're in uncharted territory in some respects. Um, so we'll have to let this play out and see where we're at. Um, the legislature certainly could set the yield, uh, notwithstanding, set the yield and uh, live by it. You remarked in your speech introducing former Governor Haley on Sunday, uh, the number of people in the room, the energy, the passion. <clears throat> now that uh, Nikki Haley has dropped out of the race, where do you want to see that go? Um, I think, for the most part, um, you know, from a national perspective, we'll, we'll be living uh, this um, rematch for the next number of months. So I think people should pay attention, uh, try and do their research, um, making sure that uh, they do everything they can uh, to prevent, I, my opinion, uh, prevent uh, Donald Trump from being president again. So doing all you can individually to make that happen. Um, if somebody has asked you for suggestions on what that looks like. What, what advice would you offer them? Which? Do whatever they hear so oh. Do whatever you can to make sure. Well, don't vote for Donald Trump, number one. Um, number two, educate uh, your family members. Try and do your research and homework. Hold them accountable for all the things he says and does that aren't accurate and uh, make sure you tell your neighbors and your friends and family um, and try to, to at least understand what their position are, is, listen to them, but offer um, maybe some counterpoints to what's being presented because it's not all factual. And you've said you plan to do everything you can to prevent 
the former president from returning to the White House. What does that look like for you now? Well, again, I think I've done um, some here. Uh, my resistance to, uh, to Donald Trump over the last four to six years. So I uh, will continue to do so. Is there a universe where you could see yourself casting a, a vote for President Biden again? Um, that's always a possibility. I did it before, but um, but we'll let things play out. We have a long ways to go before the general election. We've been about a year since we had a permanent Secretary of Education. Do you think do we need to invest in the AOE in order to see some cost containment or you know leadership that could lead to lowering education costs? I think uh, you know we we live in a state where there's it's local control, and uh, that is different than other states. So um, we have to recognize that and uh, maybe contemplate, you know, talk about bold ideas. I know some people have talked about a single member district in Vermont uh, that may, may or may not be on the table. Um, but, um, but we'll have new leadership soon enough, and we'll go from there, and we'll offer any suggestions we can. Uh, to get us to a place where we're able to deliver a quality education in Vermont at a price Vermonters can afford. You, you mentioned the local control element. It's, it's obviously so key here. Um, you've also mentioned, you know, maybe it's time to completely reimagine how we pay for education. Could that mean you know, an approach that uh, involves a stronger hand from the state, you know, limiting what kind of spending decisions can be made on a local level? I think, I think it could, yes. Um, and that's not going to be popular. I might just saying that probably isn't popular, but I think it has to be on the table. And you've also said it seems like it might be impossible to get property taxes to you know, what would be an acceptable um, increase. What, what would be acceptable? What could you, if we walk away from this budget year and taxes went up X percent, you know, wh where, where would that line have to be? To get your yeah, hard hard to say. Um, you know, I've I vetoed budgets uh, for going three percent over, yeah. so uh, my tolerance is pretty low. You designated this month as Problem Gambling Awareness Month to cover balancing online sports betting and that, and kind of making the resources available. Yeah, we want to make, to make sure that people uh, do so responsibly, whether it's alcohol or gambling. Um, we want people to know that there are resources there to help them if they have a, an issue with, uh, with gambling, problem gap gambling. And uh, we'll continue to do everything we can from a regulatory standpoint to make sure that people are protected. season we've been having the past couple of years with um, you know the warm winters all the rain they're looking at some expenses related to having to operate in the woods in such muddy conditions and you know comply with the Clean Water Act and all that um, what are our thoughts on finding funding for that industry to help it sort of navigate that yeah, I know the loggers in particular have been suffering uh, for the last couple of years, both with the mild winters, um, extended mud season, uh, but also with the flooding. So they were hit with like three separate issues. Um, so I'm sensitive to that. Uh, we have working lands uh, that, uh, that could be an, uh, an approach, an avenue, uh, as well as we've over the years have provided uh, funding for bridges uh, so they can get into the woods over some of the streams, temporary bridges uh, that can be utilized uh, that we have in, in stock. So I'm sensitive to it, but uh, I don't have any, um, any answers that would uh, provide them with probably the level of, of participation help that they're looking for. But I'm sensitive. This is part of, uh, part of Vermont and part of who we are. And, and uh, we need we need loggers to stay in business. Thank you. 
Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good afternoon, Governor. Um, just a thought as with some town is starting to get into uh, tax sales, um, what do you tell the Vermonters who can't pay their property taxes because, uh, because it's so high now, because of the education system, and they're about to uh, lose the houses in tax, so what, what's your advice to them? Yeah, um, again, um, we have income sensitivity uh, in the state. Uh, in fact, I think it's fairly generous, I believe, up to $150,000 in income or somewhere around that. Um, so there is help in that regard. Um, so take advantage of that. Make sure you're, you're getting what you deserve uh, there. Uh, but it may be too late at this point uh, for that if, if their home is up for tax sale because um, that would have to be a long, drawn-out process. But, um, but again, we can, uh, if, if they think that they've been um, taken advantage of in any way, uh, Department of Financial Regulation it could help. Uh, but, um, but if you have an issue, give us a call. We'll see what we can do to help you through it. But, um, but I'm not promising we can solve it, but we can at least look into it. Thank you. Governor, getting back to the property tax thing for a second, um, have you had like a, a sit down, direct one on one meeting with, or maybe one on two, uh, with the speaker and the pro tem about this? I've uh, spoken to the speaker about this. We have we meet every other week. Um, the pro tem, we have missed a couple of meetings. Um, they, he is canceled, so. I haven't had any direct communications with him about this issue. Uh, Governor, any comment on the uh, vacancy in the legislature that Representative Mulvaney Stanek will leave when she assumes her role as Burlington? Um, well, congratulations to her, uh, by the way. She, uh, she ran a great race and, and look forward to working with her in, uh, in her new role. Um, we will do like we do with every other uh, vacancy. A wait for names from the party she is a member of. She's a progressive, uh, so the pro progressive party in Burlington will get together and submit three names to us, and we'll consider those uh, and make an appointment. Going back to and by the way, I've done this um, throughout my political life here as governor. Um, adhere to that principle that I laid out that we would appoint. Uh, based on on the party affiliation, you don't I don't have to do that, uh, but I think it's it's good to uh, to give credit where credit's due. You you, um, you appoint somebody from the party that they represented and not play games with it. We know that teacher health care is driving up property taxes. Um, you advocated for a long time for uh, statewide health care negotiations. I know that that came to fruition, not exactly how you wanted to see it. The makeup of that negotiating commission is a little different, but we, we have statewide health care negotiations. Why, you know, what's yeah. not working there? Well, I think they took out a lot of the provisions, and um, I can get you more details on that, but they, they didn't do it the way we had asked them to do it. I think it would have been uh, much more constructive, much more fruitful uh, when the way we had it, uh, but they, they did it, did it a different way, and I think it's actually um, created more harm than good. It's co it ended up costing more. I know it's early. Uh, any plans for the uh, eclipse? Where you'll be? What you'll be doing? No, I've, I've thought about that. Um, I don't think you have to go too far, right? You can probably, if we have a clear day, see it anywhere uh, in this area right here north. So I haven't, uh, I haven't made any specific plans on that. What do you, I mean, we've talked a lot with you know, your commissioners and people in now state government, but I mean, what do you think it's going to be like? I mean, it depends on the weather, right? Dark. Like, <laughs> <laughs> with, with tens, maybe hundreds of thousands, you know what I mean? Like how, how has that been weighing? I, well, we've tried to prepare, you, you know, we've, 
public safety has been involved, transportation has been involved. I mean, you go as far as, you know, where are people going to be able to stay? Are they just going to pull over on the side of I-89 uh, when this happens? Uh, it's just all these things. Uh, we've been running different scenarios to try and prepare for this. So I just hope everyone's safe, uh, that they are prepared and, and we'll have signage out uh, alerting them to this. and. Uh, Take it, take it in safely uh, with the right protection, but take it all in because we won't see this again in our lifetime. Any I hope so. <laughs> we'll see. I'm sorry. Two hundred million dollars worth. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it'll be two hundred and thirty million dollars worth, but um, but it should be a bump. Thank you all very much.